I now look to Professor Julian Savalescu to close the case for the proposition. Here, here. So, ladies and gentlemen, what an important debate. And what a privilege it is to be here, as Raoul said, in this great institution, but especially for me to follow from one of my, after one of my superheroes of science, Professor Sir Ian Wilmot, a man I believe should also have been awarded the Nobel Prize. So I try now to summarise our case and deal with some of the flimsy arguments of the opposition. <laughs> but Norm Fost, I have to start by asking you, what are you doing here? Last time I saw this man was in 2008 in New York. We were both on, on the same side of a debate at that time, pounding Dick Pound for his failed arguments uh, opposing the legalisation of doping. You were on the right side at that time. What has happened? You've turned over to the dark side. <laughs> I only wonder whether there's a little bit of ageing going on, a bit of softening of the brain. Perhaps need a bit of gene editing. <laughs> The reality is that we all need gene editing. Um, the human animal is not some finely balanced masterpiece of di divine creation or design. It's the result of ad hoc selection under particular environmental pressures. 250 genetic diseases. Human DNA contains viruses, three to five recessive mutations that can cause life-threatening illnesses in your offspring. As you grow older, you accumulate mutations, you age, and you get cancer. Only one in five embryos ever makes it to be a baby because of genetic abnormalities, and 6% of those are abnormal. Frankly, I find it offensive when Raoul, even though he sat medical school seven times, sits in Oxford and tells us we should accept the struggle, we should accept our imperfections. Tell that to a parent of a baby dying of a major genetic condition. And Norm Foster's has looked after a lot of those, so I'm very surprised that you're on that side of the debate. Um, what matters to us is our well-being and our autonomy. And if we can change that with our science, we should. There's a kind of genophobia that elevates genes above their status in life. Genes are simply stuff stuff that produces proteins, and proteins perform functions. There's no difference in principle to changing a gene or cha changing a protein. I'll give you the success story of modern genetics so far. It's called phenylketonuria. This is an inherited disorder of amino acid metabolism where the enzyme phenylalanine hydroxylase is missing. So these people accumulate phenylalanine. Fortunately, we understand the basis and there's a heel prick test available just after birth. And if you're found to have this, you'll put on a felon, phenylalanine poor diet for the rest of your life. What does that mean? No bread, no pasta, no soybeans, no egg whites, no shrimp, no chicken breast, tuna, legumes, even delicacies like crayfish and lobster. And note, importantly, no seal, whale or elk meat. Now, I don't know about you, but I'm not, I, I couldn't do without my, my regular whale. And imagine that you're an Eskimo and you're told no, no seal, elk or whale. If you could produce the enzyme and get it into the cells and avoid this horrific diet, surely we have an ethical obligation to do that. And if we can change the gene to produce that enzyme, the same obligation exists. Yes? Um, I, I only ask respectfully, where does autonomy play a role? And come coming, coming. from necessity, do I not have this, uh, an option as an individual to choose whether or not I want to participate in such genetic modifications? I'll come to the, uh, the way in which enhancement can uh, enhance autonomy. At this point, parents face a choice. Is their child going to have cystic fibrosis or not? There's no way of delaying the choice. There's no question of the child having autonomy or giving consent. There's another principle, ought implies can. If the embryo can't consent, it's irrelevant. So parents must put a child on a low phenylalanine diet. They must give the child the enzyme that treats the disorder. And they must gene edit if that's possible. We heard a lot of talk about what is an ethical imperative, how is it necessary. 
I'll give you an ethical imperative. A child is bleeding to death, the parents are Jehovah's Witnesses, and they refuse a blood transfusion. It's an ethical imperative. They give the blood to save the child's life. And if they refuse, you take them to court, as Norm would, and you transfuse the child, because the court will authorise it. If the parents refuse to treat the child's cystic fibrosis at birth, you take them to court and you treat the cystic fibrosis. Because cystic fibrosis, despite all the arguments about dyslexia and autism and Einstein and I don't know who else and the disagreements we have and value pluralism, we can identify serious disorders and we can treat them. And if we should treat them and we should use our genetic science to do that. Here's a new argument. No one has heard this today, until tonight. Not only is it good for the child, justice requires it. How is that so? Well, let me give you an example. Another genetic disorder, Gaucher's disease. Disorder of metabolism. Can be lethal, affect the liver, lungs, spleen, blood system, brain. Now, there is a treatment for this now, an enzyme called glucocerebrosidase. Glucocerebrosidase. Problem is, it's very expensive. £100,000 per patient per year to treat this disorder. Very effective treatment. There's about 180 patients in the UK. Costs 18 million a year to treat this disorder. Now, there was prenatal diagnosis and genetic selection that people used to use to have children that weren't affected. But once this became available, they didn't want to kill their baby. They wanted to cure it. A gene therapy, a gene edit, would be a one hit, one intervention that would cause the body to produce that enzyme. Probably cost a few thousand pounds. That's just one disorder. Think of the amount of money that you could save. Now, here's the ethical obligation. You've got an obligation to choose the more cost-effective treatment because in a limited health budget, as the NHS has, what you take up, others can't have. You could be using that money to save other people who can't be treated through gene editing. So here are six reasons to manipulate human DNA. The first is we can cure single gene disorders, as I've discussed. Genetic selection, or using prenatal diagnosis or pre-implantation genetic diagnosis, can achieve that end. But as I said, parents want to cure their baby, not kill it and replace it with another baby. Secondly, most of the disorders that we will suffer from are not single gene disorders. They're polygenic disorders. Schizophrenia may have 100 genes involved. Cardiovascular disease, 35 genes. You can't select embryos to select against those kinds of diseases. To just select across 20 genes, you'd have a 1% chance in ordinary IVF. But in animals, gene editing has been able to produce changes in 50 genes in a single animal. Third reason, correct natural inequality. Evolution has no mind to fairness or equality. We are all born unequal. And so, some of those inequalities have life determining outcomes. Let's imagine Raoul gives up his expensive cologne. He's a rich fat cat cardiologist. He's going to make you this offer. He's going to give you 140 pounds now or 1,400 pounds in five years' time. Show of hands, who takes 140 now? So maybe you have a terminal illness or you've got a gambling debt you need to pay off tonight. <laughs> For some other reason. Who takes the 1,400? Good answer. In Sweden, they did exactly this piece of research on 13-year-old children and followed them 18 years later. If you defer the 1,400 kroners, in that case, you're 33% less likely to commit property crime. This confers, confirms Walter Michel's work on the importance of self-control and the ability to delay gratification. More friends, more motivation to succeed, higher socioeconomic status, more likely to enter university. The reason why Raoul's here is because he's one of the lucky ones. He's able to, to study. To, to, to turn up seven times to sit that exam. <laughs> you can be normal, but at the low end, and you're going to suffer, you're going to end up in jail. That's why 10% of children are on Ritalin. Now, when people say, well, we don't know what we're going to enhance, I'll give you one thing. Poor impulse control and inability to delay gratification. One study showed 
that giving Ritalin to people with attention deficit disorder reduced violent reoffence by 30 per cent, a massive reduction in criminality. That's something that we can agree on. And you asked me about autonomy. To be autonomous is to make your own choices about the whole of your life. To be able to delay gratification opens up future options for you. Not only does it mean you'll end up richer, happier, with more friends, it also means you'll have more options. That's an example of something that we can agree on. Even if we can't agree on whether it's better to be normal or manic depressive. Okay, here's my second novel argument. And one of the ladies cleverly, cleverly um, preempted it. Disease resistance. We heard before about the attempt to modify the CCR5, uh, CCR5 gene to confer HIV resistance. In my view, the greatest threat to humanity is biological, the use of biological weapons. It's within the capacity of hundreds of thousands of people today in a small backyard laboratory, laboratory to create viruses capable of killing millions of people. And you can engineer super lethal viruses. Smallpox, the scourge of humanity, we heard. 70 million people saved over 40 years. You come within three feet of somebody with smallpox, there's a 30% chance you'll get it and a 30% chance you'll die. Scientists have engineered a 100% lethal version of smallpox. It only takes one individual out of 7 billion and 1% of the human population are psychopaths, so there's 70 million of them. One of those people to decide to create smallpox in a backyard laboratory, as in the film 12 Monkeys, release it in 12 airports, and the whole of civilization is at threat. Now we're powering on with this research in biology, in plants, in viruses, in bacteria, in animals. We're even creating novel life forms. Craig Venter is creating novel life forms using synthetic biology. In order to have the ability to resist this, maybe we'll need to be able to rapidly engineer resistance in the human being using this kind of technology. Maybe our only hope for surviving the biological holocaust will be our ability to rapidly modify the human being. So this talk of designer babies can be put to one side. OK, as I said, justice requires it. Let me just say one thing about Ryle's favourite quote, don't treat the social with the biological. Complete nonsense. Nonsense. <laughs> Four ways of addressing any problem. Change the natural environment, change the social environment, change psychology, change biology. Which you pick just depends on what the cost-benefit ratio of each of them is. I'll tell you what causes skin cancer, and that's sun. Now, you can avoid sun exposure, but you can also choose to develop immune therapies that effectively treat an, a natural causation with a biological intervention. Whether we should choose biological interventions just depends on whether they're going to be the most effective. And we should certainly, as Ian Wilmot said, try to understand the basis of disease. I want to now turn to one of their familiar objections that this is going to create enormous inequality. One thing that Ian stressed is that not only is this about regenerative medicine, about enabling self-transplantation with your own cells, it's about understanding disease and developing drugs for, for motor neurone disease or for common conditions. Using this kind of research can create new disease models involving human tissue that we can test new drugs for common conditions that affect people all around the world. So not only can this increase inequality, it can reduce it. And how we choose to use this, for all the talk about capitalism and the problems of power, I agree with all that. That isn't, that isn't, that isn't unique to gene editing. It applies to healthcare, computing, everything. How we choose to use this is up to us, and we could use it to reduce inequality. I want to deal with one last objection, and this was that these moral imperatives can go wrong. We heard about uh, the, the terrible um, destruction of the, Indian, the Indians in the United States and California and, and various other terrible misuses of power. As Linda said, any powerful technology can be misused. What I standardly hear is, isn't this just what the Nazis would have done? Wouldn't the Nazis have, and we heard the blonde hair, blue eyed sort of analogy. And of course, it is something that could be used to enslave people from the very inside. But what was distinctive about Nazi eugenics 
was that it was coercive, it was designed by the state to pursue a racial, racist, social, Darwinist ideal, and it was based on bad science. Today, we still have eugenics in the form of Down syndrome screening, but it's free, couples make their own choice. It's based on a reasonable conception of health and well-being for the child, and it's based on good science. The fact that a technology can be misused is no reason to oppose it. The Nazis used sterilisation. That's not a reason to ban sterilisation. We still have an ethical imperative to use sterilisation in certain circumstances, for example, to save a woman's life. OK, in conclusion, nature has not created us necessarily to be healthy or to have long lives. Science and technology now gives us the possibility of achieving that. There's vast natural inequality, both in terms of disease genes and non-disease by ethics. So what are those ethical principles? This technology ought to be used to promote human well-being, to promote autonomy, according to principles ju of justice, and to preserve the species as a whole. The UK Parliament has already voted with its feet on this motion when it approved mitochondrial transfer in February 2015. This saves about 150 lives a year, it is genetic manipulation of the human being. It's misleadingly described as three-person IVF. It's really a micro-organelle transplantation, and it's entirely appropriate that they approve this legislation. In this year, the human, in, this year in February, the Human Fertilisation Embryology Authority granted a licence to the Francis Crick Institute to begin experimentation on embryos up until 14 days using gene editing to study embryonic development. We shouldn't leave things to nature, but we should use ethics, principles of promoting human well-being, autonomy and justice. We can use policy to rein in effectively our practices. As the first speaker said, if you're concerned about moral enhancement or designer babies, you can create laws. There are no cloned babies, even dis despite us having the power to do that for many years. We can use our laws to make us and our children have better lives, and to let the Eskimos eat their whale. Vote aye and support this proposition, as Professor Wilmot said. This is not just a trivial debate. It's about the debate, a debate about the future of humanity, and let's make that a better humanity.